Good afternoon. Today is the 30th of May in the year 2012. I'm Daryl Peterson, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in Palm Springs, California. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts, uh, especially World War II. Uh, today we're here uh, at the museum and have the honor and privilege of interviewing Bob Lilac, who was in the U.S. Air Force and uh, retired as a colonel uh, after uh, many years of service. So we're going to talk to him about his experiences in Vietnam and other activities in the Air Force. And uh, we're glad to have so, you here. Robert. Looking around to see how I could get my share of combat in mm -hmm. Vietnam and who was going where. And I also was looking for other opportunities to fly, see what I could fly when I came back. Normally, I probably would have been still assigned to the F-100 back to a stateside base, which would then later deploy to Vietnam. But I, uh, I heard about this airplane called the F-104 that there was only one squadron of tactical fighters um, of F-104s assigned to a tactical fighter unit. There were some assigned to interceptor missions in Air Defense Command. But I heard about this one unit and through a couple of connections made a phone call to a, one of the uh, assignments people in Washington at that time whom I didn't know. I got his phone number from a buddy of mine and called him up and they said, hey I'd sure like to go fly this F-104 and then before it's uh, finished its career and I'd also like to get to go to Vietnam and he said he said well why you and I said well I don't know because I got your phone number you know, <laughs> to start off with and a friend of mine just did that uh, and he got assigned to the 104 so I kind of followed in his footsteps a little bit and luckily was able to uh, get an assignment to be assigned to um, the 479th Tech Fighter Wing at and, George oh, Air Force okay, Base yeah, in, in Victorville, yeah. California. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes and uh, went, checked out in the F-104 and uh, in early 65 and at that time again about the time I arrived at George Air Force Base at Victorville, California the, uh, the wing was sending squadrons uh, temporary duty TDY to Vietnam, to Da Nang hmm. and uh, I was able to be assigned to the third squadron and after the first two squadrons completed their short temporary duty assignments to Da Nang, the squadron that I was assigned to was sent temporary duty to Vietnam so I complete, uh, went on my first combat tour to Vietnam in September of 1965 after several months being checked out in the 104. So I was a relatively new guy. So things in have the been building up uh, kind of a, a year already then. Uh, well, I wasn't, I didn't quite have a year. I had about six months. No, I mean of, the Vietnam. Oh, Vietnam had been building up. Yeah. Viet yeah. And yes, and there were a lot of missions, uh, uh, fighter bomber missions. The F-104 uh, didn't really carry very much very far as far as bombs were concerned. Uh, remember that airplane, it was uh, fast, very small wings. Um, could get someplace in a hurry, but couldn't carry much to that spot, well, and it was uh, and it basically supposed to be an interceptor. Yeah, get, right? go find somebody, get out fast as you could go to find somebody. It's a Mach two plus airplane, and uh, and then turn around and come home. Well, in Vietnam, it was used as an escort airplane to keep bad guy airplanes, MIGs or whatever, off of somebody whom you were trying to protect. Mm -hmm. The first mission that we had at Da Nang was flying uh, patrol for a uh, radar uh, constellation, a C-121, RC-121, that was flying in the Gulf of Tonkin, keeping an eye on enemy air activity, and we were flying orbits over the top of this RC-121. So here's a Mach 2 plus airplane trying to fly with <laughs> escort this propeller driven C-121 that was uh, u doing its radar mission down on pretty much on the deck in the Gulf of Tonkin. It wasn't a very exciting mission. It was an important mission. We'd take off out of Da Nang, refuel the tanker and go up and fly over the top of uh, uh, 
the RC-121, and then you know patrol for three or four hours, periodically refuel refueling, and then come back and land at the name. We also flew a few missions in support of uh, air-to-ground requirements, dropping 750-pound bombs or napalm or shooting the gun in support of either U.S. Army units operating in the Da Nang area or more frequently Marines. Hmm. Didn't fly a lot of missions there then. I only flew about 20 on this whole temporary duties uh, assignment to Da Nang and uh, we returned we were replaced by some F-4s. They thought the F-4 could carry more and do other more varied missions. So the F-104s were temporarily assigned to Taiwan, sort of in the holding pattern, before we came home. And our unit, that particular unit that I was in, came home, um, the 476 squadron, came home in uh, December of 65. So in December of 65, I returned to Georgia Race in Victorville. And had to, I, we were training a lot of new pilots in the F-104 at that time, getting ready to take on another mission, and uh, I very soon became instructor pilot and was teaching uh, people who were coming in to get their combat tours. Um, they were coming from other airplanes, so I was transitioning, I was uh, acting as an instructor pilot, transitioning these new pilots in the F-104. And we had a wide variety of pilots, pilots who had flown the Goonie Bird, pilots who had flown um, uh, hospital C-9s, uh, some people had flown T-39s, a lot of people didn't have much fighter experience. And we had a fair number of fighter pilots coming from, like I had done, from F-100s, coming from F-101s to transition into the F-104. Kind of had to uh, go screaming to the director of operations when the unit was then again assigned permanently back to Vietnam to Udorn Air Base in Thailand. Hmm. But I, I hadn't completed 100 missions in North Vietnam and I wanted still to get my share of combat and a little bit more real combat. So I, I volunteered, and, although the DO director of operations wanted to keep me there as a uh, instructor pilot. Uh, he listened to my pleading as I got down on my knees and begged him, <laughs> <laughs> saying I wanted to go back to Vietnam. So I got to go back for my second tour and went to Udorn, in which we flew a very interesting mission. But um, I was still able to complete my home. Still in the 104? In the 104 again. Uh -huh. Yeah, still in the 104. Yep. There we flew a, a, a more wide variety of missions. Uh, flew about, um, well, to to complete your combat tour in Vietnam, you either spent a year in South Vietnam flying missions, in which you could fly hundreds of combat missions, right. or in North Vietnam, where the uh, defenses were a lot heavier, we uh, would the combat tour was defined as 100 missions. So as I said, I had about 20 missions when I went over, so I needed to get another 80 missions, 80 counters, they called it, up north, plus a few others down south. But um, we started off with flying uh, uh, Wild Weasel Escort, in which uh, F-105s were going up around Hanoi, seeking out missile sites to keep them off the backs or unable to fire missiles at the fighter bombers coming in to hit strategic targets around Hanoi. So we would fly as escort to the 105s to protect them from MiGs. In a lot of cases, MiGs, um, well, there was a, several political things going on there. Mm -hmm. um, when we were flying, the MiGs would not come up. I don't know if they were afraid of the 104 or something else was going on on the ground. But we'd fly over uh, uh, Kep Air Base or Fukien Air Base around Hanoi, and you could see MiGs on the ground, but we weren't allowed to hit them on the ground. Hmm. Politically, the U.S. was uh, afraid of uh, raising the diplomatic stakes, I guess. Uh, I'm afraid there were Russian Russians, pilots. Russian yes. pilots and or technicians on the ground, yeah. and they didn't want to stir that pot, so we were not allowed to hit those airplanes on the ground. And uh, I never saw one in the air. I chased one airplane uh, from the 
Gulf of Tonkin over Hainan Island, which is uh, in in the uh, China, Hainan Island in China. It turned out to be a Navy RB-66. <laughs> Luckily, I identified him before I told my wingman to de disarm his missiles. <laughs> he was locked yeah. on to them. Anyway, uh, the, the wild weasel missions were interesting in that we were uh, we were being fired at by missiles pretty heavily. Um, and one mission, guy got shot down in front of me. Hmm. Same day, guy got shot down in the flight behind me. Uh, we had about 15 guys, and in the first three months of that second tour that I was on, we had lost five. Actually picked up one, four. Two were prisoners of war, two were killed in the airplane crashes, one shot by missile, one shot by ground fire. Two other guys were shot down by missiles and or ground fire. And uh, so were you made, getting low enough or was we this were, the um, No, in and, different 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 cases, different missions. When we were dropping bombs, oh, we were flying pretty low. Yeah. When you're at delivery. Yeah. And my flight commander got shot down during that. And the missions that where the guy got shot down in front of me and behind me both were missiles. My operations officer was shot down in front of me, and a young lieutenant who I had checked out in the 104, um, actually was a captain by then, um, was uh, hit by a missile. He probably, he had, he didn't have enough warning on the missile. Sometimes we got electronic warning from the 105s we were flying with. Other times you'd see them. You could outfly the missile by turning into it and making it try to make a hard turn, you make a harder turn, mm -hmm. and the missiles didn't have big wings. You didn't have big wings either, but you could outfly mm -hmm. the missile. Yeah. So there were various kind of techniques to avoid the missiles. But uh, so, you know, nominally, uh, we lost about 30% of our guys in those first few months I was there. Our losses in the 104 were not as high as some of the 105 units. They were up as high as 50% and more in yeah, they particular were, times. They were the ones that were They were the fighter bombers dropping them. the bombs on the steel plants, on the bridges, and other things. The only uh, real targets that I shot at while I was on those uh, missile suppression missions, they were called wild weasels, and there's a real nice History Channel uh, movie of suicide missions uh, titled Suicide Missions about the Wild Weasel Mission. Mm -hmm. And I flew, I think I flew about eight, 16 or 18 of those. And uh, we would sometimes, if we were at the end of our mission and the MiGs weren't flying, we carried AIM-9 Sidewinders, heat-seeking missiles, and had the gun. Sometimes if the F-105s found a missile site and were shooting it, we'd go in and strafe it with them. Um, other times we were carrying two 750-pound bombs or cluster bombs and dropping, uh, hitting targets on the, uh, um, in, in the Mugia Pass and on the trail uh, where they're carrying supplies down from North Vietnam into South mm -hmm. Vietnam. Well, was this uh, 105 G's by that time or was it the early version? They, they were, no, they were, they were flying, they were flying uh, F-105 uh, F's as it was the weasel mission, okay. and uh, the G then, was later where they had a lot of electronics. Stuff yes, on a lot more. Them. Well, they had electronics. They had electronics, and um, I don't think that there are any G's flying when I was flying. I finished my tour in uh, December of '66 and came home just before Christmas. Um, had an opportunity at the end of my tour to participate in a uh, big planning conference uh, at Yuban, uh, headed up and by the commander at that time, famous commander Robin Olds, mm -hmm. who uh, his vice commander was Chappie James, who was an Air Force, four-star general, African-American, um, participate in a conference in which part of our uh, work at that conference was to devise tactics to get at the MiGs figure out a way to get them, get them up in the air and do things. And that was where the famous Operation Bolo was planned in which the F-4s from Yuban and uh, Takli and Da Nang fooled the North Vietnamese defenses into thinking they were 105s going in to strike targets without escorts. And they got a, quite a pile of MiGs and uh, 
that mission didn't get off the ground, I think it was September, excuse me, February 1st, 1967, so shortly after I left. Mm -hmm. A couple of guys that I was in the planning uh, phases of that mission with uh, actually stayed or flying the fours and, and did shoot down MIGs. So it was a it was an interesting overall assignment besides being able to do what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. fly the 104 and complete my combat missions. <laughs> yeah. So, but did you get a hundred or? Yes, I finished. Oh, Actually, yeah. I okay. I had a total. I think my total missions were 118, but some of those were. Uh, were not counters, not not North Vietnam, but I had 100, 100 missions over North. Actually, a few more than 100 missions over North Vietnam. Uh -huh. So I got my 100 mission patch, filled my square, and uh, <clears throat> came back to uh, uh, another assignment in 104s uh -huh. at Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. Where so you you came to that back to Victorville, though your family was still in Victorville. No, no, my family, my family had our assignment was. In, at Udorn was a permanent change of assignment. My family had gone to New York, oh. which is where my wife wanted to be with the children. So she went back basically to hometown and uh, came back to uh, uh, a new assignment, but it was in F-104s at Phoenix, Arizona at Luke Air Force Base as mm -hmm. an instructor pilot teaching. We had a squadron of airplanes at Luke uh, teaching German pilots how to fly the F-104. So I had a short stint there of about six months flying the F-104G, the German F-104, which was sort of a Cadillac version, had inertial navigation system in it and a lot more bells and whistles, and before I went off to uh, Edwards Air Force Base to the Aerospace Research Pilot School. Okay, uh, what, how did you manage to get into that? that was you, you must have had to pull some strings. <laughs> no, I, there, I didn't have any strings to pull. Uh, it was uh, it was something that was kind of a, uh, a follow-on to uh, my interest in flying fighters, and that I wanted to fly more, better, faster, do other things. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of uh, things that I could have gone to. I could have tried to become a uh, pilot uh, tried, tried out for the Thunderbirds for the acrobatic team if I wanted to. Um, I didn't know if I would, could cut that mustard. I probably could have, but the Air Force at the time was uh, looking for uh, astronaut trainees, if you will. And uh, you had to have certain qualifications. A lot of flying time, a lot of fighter flying time was best. Um, engineering degree, which I had, or academy degree, I had an engineering degree, <clears throat> so uh, I just made an application to the mm. what was called at the time the Aerospace Research Pilot School, okay. and I made that application while I was in Vietnam. I went back to the German program, hadn't been selected yet, and about the time I was reporting to become an, an instructor pilot in the German F-104 program at Luke, I was notified I was selected for the Aerospace Research Pilot School. We called it an astronaut prep school and uh, to report in June of 67. So the people at Luke only got about six months work out of me as an instructor pilot mm -hmm. before I bailed out then and went to uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Okay. So did you bring your family to Edwards? Or? No, my family stayed because my okay. young son, uh, Bobby, uh, who was deaf, uh, went to a special school in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. So they stayed in, uh, in Phoenix. My uh, fourth child, daughter Peggy, was born, uh, so uh, they stayed in uh, at Phoenix, in this, where Bobby could go to special school. So David and Laura and Bobby and Peggy, four kids and Pat, were staying there while I was at Edwards. And I'd go back on weekends to visit the family, take a T-33 or right. F-104 and fly <laughs> all the way from Victorville to Phoenix, you know, it was a good deal. and. Um, and uh, then got to go into a great program up at Edwards. It was. Uh, were you with the astronauts then? Were they out it was, there at that time? Or? There were there were some of them there. Yes, there were some of them that just finished the school and gone. But the the astronauts is it's, it's kind of a funny term. You know, this was 1967, so the uh, you know the, the the Mercury, Gemini, and of course Apollo program was uh, 
be fully cranked up then. So all the guys in the right stuff were either flying there at Edwards or were uh, off of Houston uh, with NASA. Mm -hmm. um, but the Air Force was building up a cadre of astronaut trainees and they developed this aerospace research pilot school program which was a, a further um, evolution of the old test pilot school in which they added a lot of uh, heavy academics and different kinds of flying to the curriculum and it was probably I thought it was about 50-50, maybe it was a little bit more heavy on the astronaut training, but about, let's just say for talking purposes that it was half of it was teaching you how to be a test pilot and half of it exposing you to the things that you'd be exposed to if you were selected to be an astronaut. And, and there was included a lot of uh, simulation, a lot of academics, and some very special flying. Um, test pilot school is basically hard work and precision flying. People say that, you know, being a test pilot is hours and hours and hours of boredom interjected <laughs> with a few moments of sheer terror. But um, uh, the test pilot portion was primarily flying T-33s, T-38s, and an exposure to a lot of other kinds of airplanes, gliders, variable stability, B-25, we flew a B-57, I had never flown multi-engine bombers before. So we got exposed to a lot of flying. And then as it evolved into the astronaut phase, uh, we focused more on flying the F-104. And we flew the F-104 in, uh, in a lot of different environments where it normally hadn't been flown as an, in a tactical situation. We, f we flew practice um, lifting body kind of approaches where you would be a glider like a space shuttle coming back in with no engine and you'd drop the flaps and drop the gear and <clears throat> 15,000 feet and dive at the ground in a 30 degree dive angle and pull out at 15 start pull out at 1500 feet and hopefully end all of that at the landing speed at the landing spot on the ground to practice and simulate uh, practice uh, what you would be doing if you were flying a shuttle back into a landing um, well, let's see, was the shuttle, had they even thought of the shuttle at that time? Or was I don't remember the timing on the shuttle. I think the shuttle was a little bit later. Yeah. But they were flying this lifting was, bodies. They were flying a lot of lifting yeah, bodies. Yeah, wasn't there some kind of a controversy or thoughts, I guess, of having a uh, go into orbit and then land at a, at a runway? Mm -hmm. As opposed to the Apollo, which yeah. was landing in the water with right. parachutes and stuff. So. Yeah, there, there was they there was an earlier program called the Dinosaur yeah. X twenty, which was that kind of a it was going to be launched. The vehicle would be launched on the top of a Titan missile, and go out into orbit and then come glide back into a landing. Well, in the landing phase of this astronaut prep school, aerospace research pilot school we were practicing the landing phase of that. Now the, the earlier part of uh, getting into getting to high altitude weightless and uh, flying uh, re-entry, that was uh, practiced somewhat during this phase of our program in the regular F-104. And um, at in the f about February 1968 when I was in that phase of the program I, I finished that program uh, in 19 in June of 68 there the school was able to reinstitute a program called the aerospace trainer AST which was the NF 104 um, the rocket equipped F 104 had a 6,000 pound thrust rocket in the tail there were only three of them built and uh, Chuck Yeager in I think it was 1963 when that program was just getting started was attempting to set an altitude record famous scene from the right stuff movie right. where he uh, got into a pitch up got it into a spin got out of a spin got into another spin eventually had to jump out of the airplane because he couldn't get the engine restarted he was too low got hurt pretty bad uh, when he ejected 
that air that program went into a holding pattern and there were other issues with the rocket engines with the reaction control system and it never got restarted until um, about 1967 through a test phase in 1968 it was far enough along that they let some of the aerospace research pilot students, of which I was one, uh, fly the airplane. They selected four of us out of our class of about 30 to fly it. Now why me? In this case, I wasn't the high-end academic guy. I was sort of the high-end F-104 guy. I had a lot more F-104 time than most of the other uh, pilots in the uh, research pilot school. So I was selected, I think, primarily because I could handle the 104 pretty well. So I got to fly the NF along with three other of my classmates, um, one Marine and two other Air Force officers. Harry Blatt, who later ran Marine Aviation, Dean Beacon, and uh, Mike Lowe. Mike Lowe, who later was a four-star Air Force general. And we had, uh, we had the opportunity to fly the NF-104. So in 19 June, I guess it was, 1968, I got to fly the uh, rocket F-104 to 101,380 feet. I specifically is remember that, the number. Is that the record? No, there was no, no, no there was no record. The, the altitude record was set when they had less, uh, before Jaeger jumped out, uh, a couple of pilots flew it to 118,000 feet and one Bob Smith, who was the test program director on that airplane, actually flew it to 120,000 feet, but uh, he was flying with no restrictions. Because of Jaeger's accident, they pushed a bunch of restrictions on us and limited the angle of attack that we could fly to. If you could fly the airplane sort of straight up until you ran out of everything, if the winds were right and the temperature was right and the, and the rocket pressure was right in the rocket engine, probably could have gotten to something so close to an altitude record. But, so, but 100,000 feet is still pretty good. I was happy with that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now, uh, what was the high altitude control system on that? They put a, what was it, was that a hydrogen peroxide? Uh, Combination, jet? yes. The, kind the, of the, well, there were two things. There was the rocket, which yeah. got you going up, right. and that was a hydrogen peroxide mixed with JP4 that gave you a rocket engine and boosted you to go as high as you could. Once you got up to above 85, 90,000 feet, aerodynamic controls were becoming ineffective. So they had a thing called a reaction control system, RCS. And these were small hydro peroxide rocket thrusters okay. that were in the nose, both for pitch and for yaw, and in the outside edge of the slightly extended wing for, for roll. And you flew it literally once you got above 90,000 feet you had the jet engine shut down because the jet would have over temperatured if you didn't shut it down so you had no jet engine you had a nitrogen pressurization system you had no aerodynamic controls the aileron and rudder didn't do anything that all to except maybe get you in trouble <laughs> so you flew reaction control and rocket what, thrusters yeah there's separate, separate controls separate control uh, like yeah, you weren't flying it with the stick here anymore yeah. you're flying it with a handle on, on the dashboard on the control panel and you you twisted it for roll Post it for up and down for pitch and yaw, and you rotated it for for um, yaw. Okay, so you so had like a joystick, that a little bit like a joystick on a on a computer. simulator exactly, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, and those were very small rocket thrusters, and you flew to keep your angle of attack under control, and the F-104 at those altitudes at very low Q, Q is a combination of pressure. Atmospheric pressure here on the ground, very low pressure up 100,000 feet, and airspeed. Now the airspeed was very low, even though we're still beyond the speed of sound. We have a limitation of, of 1.0 Mach even over the top, but it was still a very low indicated airspeed. So it was low Q, no aerodynamic control. So you flew it with a with a handle on the uh, control panel using your reaction control system. So the object was. And you, by the way, at this time, you're flying on a spacesuit, so we had to have a spacesuit on in case the, pressures, in case the nitrogen pressurization system failed, uh, which happened to a friend of mine. He was killed. His glove came off. Uh, you, had a, you had a spacesuit you're flying in. Uh, 
kind of like the spacesuits that the astronauts flew in uh, in Gemini at that time, and mm -hmm. maybe not quite as sophisticated as the Apollo spacesuit, but <clears throat> the uh, so you're experiencing low pressurization, uh, you're experiencing weightless, you're flying over the top, and it's kind of like going over a hill in a car, pushing forward on the stick to keep the angle of attack so that the airplane didn't pitch up, and, and you're fl so you're flying weightless, so you're experiencing weightlessness, you're experiencing reaction control system, which is the way uh, spaceships, uh, space shuttle is controlled, is with reaction control systems. And then you practice reentry. Um, I remember on my particular flight, I came back down and my nose, the paint on, my, on the nose of the airplane was bubbled and the crew chief said, you get a little fast coming down? Because <laughs> uh, you do experience the same thing that shuttles do reentering. So you had to control your airspeed and your angle of attack get back down to a reasonable altitude, uh, somewhere 35,000 feet, start up the jet engine, hopefully, in my case it started, and come back and land at the, at the uh, Edwards Air Force Base. So this if, it time, didn't, if it didn't start, you had the lake bed, so you yeah. could do a dead stick landing, and that was the reason we did it at Edwards, obviously. So this sounds like it's a really uh, preliminary uh, information gathering for an aerospace plane, I guess. It, it, it didn't, you know, it, it, it did collect some data, but it was primarily to, it was primarily developed to expose the pilots to those regimes of flight, rather than gathering specific data uh, of what was going on at 100,000 foot plus. Yeah, well, that, that's part of it is the reaction. Yeah, and whether but it was, it, was, it was literally maneuver. called the aerospace trainer and it was developed to, uh, to train astronauts. Mm -hmm. I was hoping, uh, in, when I went to the research pilot school, now and renamed back to the test pilot school, um, I was hoping to get into a, a, a NASA program there was a program called a manned orbiting laboratory. But while I was in school, that manned orbiting laboratory program was canceled for funds. Later on, after Apollo and other things, we've now developed a space station. But that manned orbiting laboratory was a precursor to the current International Space Station. Mm -hmm. But, so I had my shot at almost being an astronaut, <laughs> but I had, I had fun. I, I got out of test pilot school went off to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio as well, a test pilot. How many 104 flights did you do at high altitude? Uh, the, uh, the, the, the main zoom flight, the yeah. 101-380, was one. We did three flights in the rocket airplane. We also did uh, a bunch of build-up flights in a regular F-104. Oh, okay. yeah. And the regular F-104 could zoom, but it could probably only get to, it could only get to about 80,000, 80, 85,000 feet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's because it didn't have a reaction control system and it didn't have the rocket to, to boost you yeah. up to that altitude. Was that rocket system designed by Lockheed or what? Who rocket did? Dyne. Oh, they did it. Yeah. Okay. Rocket Dyne. And well, Lockheed developed the whole system, I mean, integrated the system. But it was a Rocket Dyne engine, uh, my AR 23 or something, I can't yeah. remember the exact mm -hmm. designation of it. But hmm. it was an interesting machine. Yeah.